Hello, everyone, and welcome to Varsity Tutors, where our friends at Wonders of Wildlife have shown us many of the wonderful ways that animals and plants in nature come together to create the beautiful world around us. And today, they're going to show us some of the many ways that we can play a part in keeping our world wonderful. Now, as we're going to see today's class, collaboration goes a long way in being good stewards of the earth, so we're going to get the chance to practice that collaboration. Throughout the lesson, be sure to use the chat panel on your live learning page to ask and answer questions as we go. And if we don't get to those questions right away, not to worry, we're going to save some time toward the end of today's lesson specifically for some Q&A. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn things over to your instructor for today, Wonders of Wildlife ed educator, Ashlyn. Take it away, Ashlyn. Hey guys, uh, like Haley said, my name is Ashlyn and I'm an educator over at Wonders of Wildlife National Museum and Aquarium, which is located in Springfield, Missouri. Here are a couple pictures from our aquarium where we have over 35,000 live animals from all over the world. We have everything from sharks to bears to alligators to even penguins. We also have our wildlife galleries, which is a museum that takes you on a journey across the globe to learn about the history of conservation and also some of the coolest creatures that call Earth home. Before we get started learning today, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. Here's a picture of me doing one of my favorite things that I do at my job, which is working with animals. I love to work with the animals here at Wonders of Wildlife. Um, and then you can see in this picture, I'm working with Mr. Bailey, who is a great horned owl. Part of my job as an educator is not only to work with the animals, but also to share my knowledge about animals and conservation with others, which is exactly what we're gonna be doing here in a little bit. But first, I want to know a little bit about you guys. So go ahead and type into your chat box what your favorite animal is. So I love learning what other people's favorite animals are. So again, um, go ahead and tell me in your chat box what your favorite animal is. My favorite animal probably has to be amphibians. So any and all types of amphibians like frogs, toads, salamanders are my favorite. I'll wait for you guys to give you a little bit to type. Looks like I'm starting to get a couple answers. I see penguins, nice. Spiders, I really like spiders too. Sharks, seeing a lot of you guys saying giraffes, elephants, different birds like eagles, toucans. Wow, you guys have a lot of favorites. You have a, some pretty awesome favorites. Um, and now that we know a little bit about each other, um, are you ready to start learning? Sounds good, okay, let's do it. So. Uh, today we're going to talk about science and how you guys can get involved in science. So I think a lot of you guys know what science is. So if you already know what science is, will you go ahead and tell me in your chat box, what is science? So tell me what is science in your chat box? Let's see, conducting, conducting experiments. Yep, you guys are on the right track. Doing research, yep. Studying things. Chemistry, engineering, biology. Yep, you guys are all giving me awesome answers. So science is the process of gaining knowledge or learning by making observations, collecting data, and doing experiments. So I don't know about you guys, but I love science. There's so many cool things we can study and learn through science. So do you guys know who someone who practices science is called? So again, really quick, uh, hop in your chat box and tell me, what do we call people who do science or who practice science? I'll give you guys just a little bit to type. Okay, I'm starting to see a lot of the right answers. You guys are doing awesome. Yep. Yep. Here we go. Yep. You guys have got this down. Good job. So someone who practices science is called a scientist. Good job, guys. So scientists have a very important job because without science, our world would look super different than it does right now. So without science, we wouldn't have any technology, any medicine, um, or many of the other things that we rely on in our day-to-day -day lives. So science plays a huge role in everyone's life. The amount of amazing things we've learned from science is out of this world. So you might be wondering, 
how in the world do scientists accomplish all these amazing things? And how does someone become a scientist? I know that I always had this question throughout the years. And shockingly, there is a pretty simple answer to that question. Um, all you have to do in order to be a scientist and discover amazing things is to just think like a scientist. So there's a very specific process that scientists follow every time they do an experiment. And that process is called the scientific method. So the scientific method is a system that allows us to test things through experiments. And it's really important because it helps us to understand why things work. So really quick, um, I want you guys to grab a piece of paper, if you have one near you, and a writing utensil, like a pen or a pencil. Um, and then I want you to follow along with me because we're going to do a little science experiment using the scientific method. Man, you guys, I think I forgot something. Hang on just a second. Hang on, I'll be right back. Okay, that's much better. I forgot my lab coat. So anyways, as I was saying, <laughs> this may be an experiment that you've done before, but even if you have done this experiment before, I still want you to follow along so you can learn about the scientific method with us. So um, in this cup here, I have some cooking oil. And then I also have some cups to the side here that have water in them with different uh, colors. So here in a second, I'm gonna take some water from each of my cups with water and then drop it into my oil using a little dropper. So um, go ahead and grab your writing utensil and um, let's see how we can use the scientific method to do our experiment. So the first step of the scientific method is to ask questions. So this should be something that we want to know. What do we want to find out from our experiment? So in the experiment we're doing now, we want to know what will happen if we drop the oil, or excuse me, if we drop the water into the oil, right? So go ahead and write your question on your paper. So for example, my question is, what happens when I drop water into the cup of oil, or if I drop colored water into my cup of oil? So your question can sound a little bit different than mine, and that's totally fine, um, but go ahead and write it down on your paper, and I'll give you guys just a second to do that. All right, are we starting to finish up our questions? If you're not done, that's okay. You can go ahead and finish up, but I'm gonna go ahead and move on. Um, so after we ask our question, we need to form a hypothesis. So a hypothesis is a statement that we can test to see what the answer to our question is. So in other words, we're gonna make kind of an educated guess as to how we think our experiment is gonna go. So in our experiment, I think when I drop the water into the oil, that the oil and water will separate, um, but I think that the colors in the water might mix together. So to turn that into a hypothesis, I need to use what's called an if-then statement. So I would say something like, if I drop water or colored water into the cup of oil, then the oil and the water will separate and the colors and the water will mix. So that would be my hypothesis. Um, again, you guys can have a totally different hypothesis than me. Um, this is your science experiment. So um, just remember your hypothesis will start with an if, and then you'll put a then. So you'll fill in the blank after then with whatever you think is gonna happen. So again, just remember your hypothesis does not have to be the same as mine. I want you to write down what you guys think will happen. And I'll give you just a second to go ahead and write that. All right, are we starting to finish up on those hypotheses? Awesome. If you're not done, that's totally okay, but I'm gonna go ahead and move on. Um, so after we have our hypothesis down, um, we get to do the fun part. So we get to test it out or do our experiment, which is gonna be the next step of the scientific method. 
So while we do our experiment, um, we want to make sure that we're making observations, which is technically the next step of the scientific method. But sometimes, like today, it's going to kind of happen at the same time as we do the experimenting. So observations are things that we notice with our senses. So this can be hearing, touch, taste, smell, um, and then, of course, things that you see as well. So um, what senses you're going to use to observe your experiment kind of depends on what you're doing. So today we're going to be looking or watching and making observations to see what happens. So while I do this, I want you guys to watch really closely and write down the things that you see. Um, you can even draw pictures or if you want to jot down a couple words, um, whatever is easiest for you. Um, so let's go ahead and do our experiment. So again, here is my cup of oil. I want to make sure everyone can see it nice and good. And then I have my water here. So I'm going to take my dropper. I'm going to hold this so you guys can see, hopefully. I'm going to take some of my water and I'm going to go ahead and drop it in here. So if you guys can kind of see what's happening to my water droplets. Can you guys see that? So there was some of my blue water. I have some red water here. I'm gonna go ahead and put that in there too and we'll see what happens. Might be a little hard to see from where you're at, but I'm making observations right now and I'll share them with you in just a second. And then I have some green water. We're gonna go ahead and put that in there. There we go. Awesome. So I went ahead and put three different colors of water in there. And it looks like that is the end of our experiment. It's a really quick one. <laughs> so um, looks like our experiment is done. And then you guys have made your observations. So now it's time for us to have a conclusion. So a conclusion is where we look at our hypothesis to see if it was correct or incorrect. Um, and then how do we know if our hypothesis was correct? So we're actually gonna look at our observations that we made. So how we normally start our conclusion is by restating our hypothesis. So for me, I would say my hypothesis was that if we dropped colored water into the cup of oil, then the oil and the water would separate, but the colors in the water would mix together. So then after I've restated my hypothesis, I would explain if my observations from the experiment supported or didn't support my hypothesis. So it looks like my hypothesis was sort of supported because the oil and the water did not mix together. Um, but it looks like I actually didn't very, I didn't have very much color mixing in my oil and water. So oil and water are what we call immiscible. Uh, which means that the oil molecules are attracted to the oil molecules and the water molecules are attracted to the water molecules. So no matter what we do, we won't be able to get the oil and the water to completely mix together. So after we have our conclusion, then we can share our findings and our results with others. So this is your time to share your discoveries with other people, um, which we don't really have time for right now, but maybe after our class, you guys can share the results of your experiment with your friends and your family members. So congratulations, guys, you completed an experiment and you're officially thinking like a scientist. So uh, guess what? No matter what type of science you want to do or where you decide to do it, the scientific method works for all of it. Um, all types of scientists from all different science branches use the scientific method. So speaking of different types of science, there are so many different types of science, and each one of them plays a really important role in helping us learn more about our world. So I have a question for you guys. What types of science are there? Can you guys name in your chat box um, a type of science or a branch of science that you guys know of. Um, and I'll go ahead and give you guys a second to type it. So what kinds of science do you guys know of? Looks like I'm starting to get some great answers. I'm seeing chemistry, biology, Astronomy, 
I see ornithology. That's a fancy one. Good job. Um, that's the study of birds. Good job. Um, love that one. Computer science. That's a good one. Geology, physics, zoology. You guys sure do know your sciences. Good job. Um, I'm seeing so many great answers coming in. That's amazing. So yeah, there's a lot of different types of science and each one of them plays a really important role in helping us learn more about our world. Um, and you guys are able to do all of these types of science from home by using the scientific method. Um, what if I told you that not only can you be a scientist, but you can also help professional scientists complete their research and experiments. So we can actually do this through a type of science called citizen science or community science. Um, citizen science is science that's done with the help of members of the public or citizens, hence the name citizen science. Um, citizen science is science for anybody and everybody. So this means that anybody, including you, can be a scientist and participate in awesome research projects and scientific experiments right from home. So citizen science is really cool and it allows anyone from anywhere to get involved in science. Um, it's a great way to learn new things and find something that you're really passionate about. So it also is super helpful to scientists that conduct research because if they need to collect a large amount of data, it can take a really long time to gather that data. So if we have a lot of people helping out those scientists, it can actually make the process go by way quicker. So I want you guys to think of a time where um, you've done something that required teamwork. So something that you did that might have required teamwork. Um, if you have help from other people, let's say like a sibling or a parent or a friend, um, it goes by a lot quicker, right? Yeah, it goes by a lot quicker. So um, if we have more people working together to achieve something, it takes way less time than if you had to do it all by yourself. And that's exactly why citizen science is so cool, because it means that we can get our results quicker and then we can get even more science done over time. So like I said earlier, citizen science is a really good way to get involved and find something that you're super passionate about. There are thousands of citizen science projects that you guys can participate in across all different branches of science. So there's something, uh, there should be something that would spark your interest. Uh, so since we are here to learn about animals, I chose to highlight some citizen science projects that are more focused on wildlife and conservation. But remember, there are projects that can be um, done in any science field out there. So let's go ahead and take a look at where you guys can find some of these citizen science projects. Um, the first place I'm going to show you guys is a website called Zooniverse. Um, so if you go to zooniverse.org, you can see their homepage, which, which looks a little bit like this. Um, if you scroll down, it'll tell you a little bit about their mission and then what Zooniverse is. Um, if you look up at the very top of the page, you'll see the button that says projects. Um, this is where you'll find all of the citizen science projects that you can be a part of um, right from home. So there is even a menu where you can choose what discipline or what subject you're interested in looking at. Um, and like I said before, there's something for everybody. So some examples of some really cool projects that I've seen on Zooniverse are things like helping decipher some manuscripts from medieval Spain, looking uh, for vortexes in Jupiter's atmosphere, and then even looking uh, through camera footage to identify some sea creatures on the ocean floor. So right now we're gonna take a look at one of my favorite Zooniverse projects, uh, which is Wild Watch Kenya. And in this project, you review images from cameras in Kenyan wildlife refuges, and then you identify the animals that you see on those images. So by doing this, you're actually helping researchers figure out what animals are living in the refuge and tracking to see where they're going. And this data can be really useful when we look at the health of certain species and populations, such as elephants and giraffes, which are uh, endangered species that live in that area. So. There's gonna be a small tutorial at the beginning uh, to show you how to use the identification system and then you're ready to go. So um, now I want you guys to help me. So let's take a look at some images from the Wild Watch Kenya trail cams. And then when you see the image pop up, I want you to type into your chat box what animals you see. So you guys are gonna help me identify these animals. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. All right, here's our first image. So go ahead and type into your chat box what animals you see. I'm gonna give you guys just a second to figure it out. All right, you guys are quick. You're already starting to get some answers in, good job. 
seeing more answers. I'm seeing a lot of the right answers. This is a pretty easy one. Just a couple more seconds. Good job, guys. So those are elephants, right? That was a pretty easy one. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and click elephant on our identification guide and it pulls up a couple questions for us to answer about the picture. So um, it looks to me like there's three elephants, right? So then I would click three elephants on the first question. Um, it asks what behaviors we see the elephants doing. So it looks like they're standing and maybe interacting. Does that look right to you guys? Yeah. And then lastly, it's going to ask us if there's any young present. So here it looks like we have an adult mother elephant and two young elephants. So that means that there are young present on the third question. So after I've taken a look at all the questions and I've filled them out, I'm going to click identify and it will give me a new image. So for this next image, go ahead and type in your chat box what animals you see. This one might be a little bit more tricky than the last one. All right, I'm starting to see some answers. I see a lot of the right answers. Good job. I'll give you a little bit longer. Yep, you guys are getting this one right too. Good job. So these are baboons. Very good. So we're going to click baboon on the identification guide. So it looks like there's four baboons. Um, so I'm going to click the number four. It looks like they're resting, standing, and interacting. So I'm going to click those buttons. And then it does appear that they might have some younger or smaller baboons in the group. So I'm going to go ahead and click yes, that there are young present. And then we're going to click identify. So that was really easy, right? Um, I love doing projects on Zooniverse because to me, it kind of feels like a game. And not only are you having fun, but you're also making a difference, which is super cool. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at another place that we can find some citizen science projects. So another great place to look for a citizen science project is a place called iNaturalist, which works a little bit differently than Zooniverse. So iNaturalist is a site that uses images submitted by citizen scientists to help professional scientists um, with research on biodiversity. So on iNaturalist, you'll be able to upload um, pictures of plants and animals that you find in your area um, to the iNaturalist database. So something super cool about iNaturalist is that even if you don't know what species of plant or animal you're looking at, when you upload it, iNaturalist has a really cool feature um, where it will help you to identify that species, which, which I think is really cool. So uh, you guys can use iNaturalist from anywhere around the world. Um, so actually about, I want to say 6 million people use iNaturalist right now, which is crazy. Um, and they're helping scientists identify species across the globe. Um, and then since iNaturalist first started, I think there's been over 100 million observations uploaded to iNaturalist. That is crazy. And it's also amazing, right? So it takes really short amount of time to upload an observation to iNaturalist. Um, so just think about how big of an impact you could make by making uh, such a or committing such a small amount of time um, to iNaturalist and then participating as a citizen scientist. So super quick, um, I'm going to show you guys how quick it is. So here's a picture that I submitted to iNaturalist not too long ago of a luna moth that I found in my backyard. Um, so once you have your picture, you're going to look for the species. It's already giving me um, some suggestions. So we know it's a luna moth. We're going to type in luna moth. And then there's a place where you can add in some notes as well. Um, if you want to, you don't have to. Um, so after that, it's going to ask you for the location where you found this um, observation at. So uh, for the sake of today's lesson, I'm going to put the location for Wonders of Wildlife. So you can see me zooming in here and locating Wonders of Wildlife on my map. And then after you set your location, um, all you have to do is click share, and then it's going to upload it to the database. And then that's it, right? So that took me less than a minute. Isn't that crazy? Um, and now scientists are now able to use what I've uploaded in their research, which is super cool. Um, here's a couple more websites where you guys can find even more citizen science projects. Um, I've also put Zooniverse and iNaturalist up as well, which are the two sites that we looked at today. 
So uh, before it's your turn to ask me some questions, I want to remind you guys that the more time we spend outside and learning about our beautiful world, the more that we're going to know about how to protect it, which is why taking part in citizen science and practicing science at home is so important. So no matter who you are or where you come from, you guys can make a difference in your community and also across the world by participating in science. So there are still um, a lot of amazing things that we haven't discovered yet. And I hope that you guys are just as excited um, as I am to get out there and think like a scientist and make a difference. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Ashlyn. And we've got plenty of really wonderful questions and a good little bit of time to start to address some of them. So we got to hear a little bit about some of your favorite, I would say, hobby ways to interact and be a good social citizen and, and be a little more involved with animals. Uh, but could you talk to us a little more about some of the things that Wonders of Wildlife specifically are involved in? Yeah, uh, so we do a lot of really cool things here at Wonders of Wildlife. Um, first off, we always encourage people to get out in your community um, and, you know, be a scientist and, you know, try to help wildlife in any way you can. Um, a lot of people that work here actually are um, doing their part also as citizen scientists and participating in their free time and doing things like that. Um, me personally, I also do um, Frog Watch, which is a really cool citizen science project. Um, Frog Watch is where you go out and you listen for uh, frogs in your area. So in the springtime, they're really active um, and they like to call a lot to each other. So when you're outside, you can listen for those different species and their different calls. Um, so then you'll record them and then upload them to the Frog Watch database. Um, so that's my favorite citizen science project. I know a lot of um, people in my area also participate in Frog Watch. Um, we also do, uh, every winter here at Wonders of Wildlife, we host um, loggerhead sea turtles um, that need to have a place to live um, that were rescued from the ocean. Um, so that's something that we do here at Wonders of Wildlife that's super cool. And um, we actually just released our loggerheads um, that we just got in this year. So they were here for about, I want to say, four months. Um, so they just got re-released back into the ocean, which is super cool. Wow, amazing. Now, this next next question is maybe a little bit of a tricky one. Uh, what about for some of our younger scientists who are interested in becoming involved in some of the activities that you just mentioned, but maybe they don't have access to a cell phone or a computer regularly? Are there any things that they can be doing, whether it's even just kind of practicing observing or things that they can be involved in to help with wildlife as well? Yeah, um, I always encourage people to get outside. Um, nature is a great teacher, I always like to say. So um, the best thing that you can do is just to educate yourself on what's going on around you. Um, volunteer your time if you can to, you know, zoos and aquariums in your area um, or other organizations that, you know, might need your assistance or your help. Um, but yeah, spend some time, spend some time outside, um, volunteer your time, and then, you know, get out and do your best to observe what's going on around you. And, you know, when you do that and you're educated about the wildlife that's going on around you and all the other things, you know, that's a great way to get involved. You don't have to always do citizen science to be a good steward of the earth. Wonderful. Now we also get to talk a little bit about how you're involved in citizen science and get to help provide some data to others. Are there any ways that the community around you, whether it's citizen science directly or maybe some other indirect things, helps you at Wonders of Wildlife and other zoos and aquariums? Yeah, um, I know a lot of zoos and aquariums uh, across the world, uh, especially here in the United States, do a lot of really cool conservation work um, and they rely a lot on volunteers. Um, so we do have a lot of volunteers that, you know, work here at Wonders of Wildlife um, and they love coming in and talking with guests and volunteering their time to uh, talk about conservation of wildlife. Um, I know a lot of places also do um, beach cleanups, um, picking up trash, things like that. Um, as a community. Um, here recently, we actually did um, a cleanup at a local river to help with hellbender conservation. So that's super cool. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of things um, here at Wonders of Wildlife that we do that um, get people in our community involved in um, participating in conservation. 
Awesome. And this was a perfect segue to a question that we got a lot of, and that was concerning volunteer work and volunteer work with animals. So could you tell us a little bit about uh, what that might look like for perhaps a student who's looking to become active in working with animals or understand what a, what a career with animals might look like? What are some of the different ways that individuals can get involved in volunteer work with animals? Yeah, um, there's a lot of different ways that you can uh, come in as a volunteer and do volunteer work. Um, I know a lot of zoos and aquariums um, have volunteer programs that you can join. Um, so no matter where you are um, in the United States or even across the world, I'm sure that there's um, a zoo or an aquarium close to you where you could volunteer your time. And I know that they would definitely appreciate it. Um, so here at Wonders of Wildlife specifically, uh, we do have a couple different volunteer opportunities. Um, so one of our biggest opportunities for volunteers is to uh, do a lot of guest engagement, which means that you're working a lot with um, people who come into the aquarium um, and you're, you know, working with the animals and kind of talking about um, the animals themselves and maybe their conservation stories. Um, so you're educating people a lot. Um, and then we also do have some volunteers as well who do work directly with our keepers and our animals. Um, and then we also have our TNT program, which means tomorrow's naturalists of today. Um, so that's a really cool program that we have for a lot of our um, teenage volunteers. So they not only get to work with animals and then also work with the public, um, but they get to work directly with our staff and learn kind of what it takes to work in an aquarium um, or in a zoo, which is super cool. So yeah, there's a lot of really cool things you guys can do. Wow, sounds like it. Now, uh, clearly you're very passionate about animals and also education. So could you talk to us a little bit more about uh, what got you interested in what you do now and any kind of guidance you have for students who might be interested in a career helping animals or educating about them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so me personally, I have always loved animals ever since I can remember. Um, I remember when I was in school, I heard about a really cool program that um, my local school district was doing with Wonders of Wildlife, which is called Wolf School. Um, so it's a really cool school that you can come to for your fifth grade year. Um, we get to do all sorts of field experiences. So you get to go caving, um, you get to go look for wildlife, go on hikes, um, all that cool stuff, but you do it during the school year. Um, and it's just for your fifth grade year. So I was lucky enough to get into the wolf school, actually, which is super awesome. Um, and it was here at Wonders of Wildlife. Um, after wolf school, that taught me a lot about um, my local wildlife and the conservation and things going on around me. Um, I, I guess, I mean, <laughs> I kept going and I volunteered my time, just like I talked to you guys about earlier um, here at the aquarium. I was a TNT for a while, so I did a lot of volunteering um, when I was younger. And then now I work here, which is super cool um, because I get to do things like this every day and share all of my knowledge with people and teach people about animals and conservation. So yeah, um, my biggest piece of advice is to just um, know what you're interested in doing. And you know, if you don't have it figured out, that's totally fine, but just follow your heart. I know a lot of people say that, but <laughs> follow your heart and do um, what you're interested in doing. And um, yeah, it's pretty easy. <laughs> Amazing. Awesome. Well, we got to we got to see some of the how to's of some of the citizen science, um, but I'd love to hear if you have any favorite stories around uh, some of the successes. So what's the impact that the citizen science has when people have the opportunity to be involved in it? Yeah, uh, there's a lot of really cool success stories with citizen science. Um, one of my favorite uh, success stories is probably um, I want to say it was down in Florida. Um, they were having some shark populations that were declining. Um, and so they enlisted the help of citizen scientists to, uh, whenever they saw a shark, take a picture of it and then upload it to a database. Um, and then over time, they uh, had all these pictures and they were actually able to do a lot of really cool research with those images. Um, and then scientists were able to use that data to actually um, get those shark populations back up, which is really cool. Um, here in Missouri, we actually have um, a lot of citizen science that's um, based around our hellbenders that we have in the area. So um, if you don't know what a hellbender is, it's actually um, a type of aquatic salamander. So uh, they're the largest species of salamander in North America and the third largest in the world. So they're really cool. Um, as I said earlier, amphibians are some of my favorite animals. So I love hellbenders a lot. Um, but 
we do a lot of um, conservation and um, citizen science work around those guys here in Missouri. So it's really cool. Wow. Now, uh, we also get to talk a lot about the scientific method and how it works and how it applies to some of the cool things going on with citizen science. Uh, so could you also talk to us a little bit more about the sciences, your interest in the sciences, and whether you have a favorite type of science? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, I love all types of science, um, specifically anything that's biology related or um wildlife management. Those are some of my favorite types of science. Um, I also really like astronomy. I don't know that much about studying astronomy, I will say, but I'm really interested in it. I love seeing all the new discoveries that are made um, from all of the satellites and telescopes we have out there. I think that's super cool. Awesome. Fantastic. Now, uh, we also got to hear a little bit about some of the cool stuff that's going on over at Wonders of Wildlife. So, Perhaps for some of our students who don't have a trip planned your way in the immediate future, are there any other ways that they can learn a little more about some of the things you guys are up to and a little more about some of your exhibits? Yeah, um, so the best way to, uh, I'm gonna say, see Wonders of Wildlife from a distance, even if you can't make it over, is to head over to our website. Um, so if you go to wondersofwildlife.org, we have a lot of really cool stuff over there. Um, we have some live stream cameras of our exhibits, um, like our otters, some of our jellyfish, our shark exhibit. Um, you guys can take a look at those. I think they're really cool. Um, another really cool thing that we have um, over at Wonders of Wildlife is called Mission Conservation. So it's an app that you can download on your phone. So you can download it from the Apple and the Android store. Um, and all it is is a virtual scavenger hunt that you guys can do from home. Um, so there's missions you can play on there. So they're just like little games. Um, and it teaches you a lot about um, animals and conservation. Um, and we upload new missions every month. So you guys um, should probably <laughs> you should download it and see what all the cool missions we have on there are for this month. Um, we also have our YouTube page for mission conservation. So you guys can hop on there and see um, all of our live streams that we've done in the past and then the ones we have scheduled to do in the future. Um, our live streams are super cool. Um, for some of our live streams, we do a really cool um, craft or an activity on there you guys can follow along with. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of really cool things that we have on our website. Very cool. And as we're, you know, approaching summer and students are thinking about being outdoors and observing wildlife a little bit, but also thinking about having opportunities to maybe spend more time with friends, spend more time with family, is do you have any advice on how our students, our young scientists can leverage collaboration, even just in person amongst themselves with their friends to become better citizen scientists? Yeah, that's an awesome question. Um, so the best thing you can do um, is to educate other people. So take what you've learned today, take what you already know about conservation and about animals and pass it along to your friends and your family members. Um, so that way they know um, all the really cool things that you know now. Um, and then you guys can work together to make an even bigger difference. Um, so in person, something else you can do is also um, if you, you know, get together with friends or family member, you guys can, you know, clean up trash you see laying around, um, make sure you guys are recycling, doing all that kinds of things. Um, because I know it may seem like something so little may not make a difference, but it truly does, which I think is super cool. Amazing. So what I'm hearing is just about all of the citizen science that we talked about today and more is very friends and family uh, centric. We have the potential to do that as a group and maximize our impact together. Very yeah. cool. Uh, <laughs> now, I know you've already given us lots of really wonderful advice on how to be uh, better you know, citizen scientists, how to make sure that we're doing the best to help the wonderful world around us. Uh, so we'll end with one more question that'll be a little more specific to those who are interested in potentially pursuing a career in the sciences, pursuing a career working with animals. So whether they're uh, younger and just getting started about learning more, or maybe they're thinking about what sorts of, you know, electives they can be considering, volunteer work they can be doing uh, to set themselves up for success. Could you talk to us a little bit more about any final advice that you have for students who are interested in uh, doing what you do, teaching, learning more about science, and being involved in work with animals when they grow up? Yeah, so similar to what I said earlier, um, just follow your heart. You know, if you're interested in something, definitely check it out. Um, I know the internet is a great resource, so definitely use that to your advantage. 
um, in researching things that you're interested in um, and finding new knowledge. Um, again, volunteering your time, things like that. Um, if you have an opportunity that you think would be really cool, definitely take it. Um, I know that I've done that in the past and it's definitely always paid off for me. So um, just make sure that whatever you're doing, um, you're really passionate about and it'll take you a long way. Yeah. Wonderful. So even if there's not a wolf school nearby for our students, there are plenty of ways that they can get involved in learning more. And as we saw earlier, plenty of different corners of the world of science that they have the potential to get involved in. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Ashlyn, once again for joining us. Thank you for everyone who tuned in and asked such wonderful questions. We hope this has just kick-started your pursuit of the sciences and, uh, and being better social citizens along the way. And in the meantime, we've got plenty of other Varsity Tutors star courses that have the potential to lean us one direction or the other, whether that's in the sciences, even perhaps some of Ashlyn's favorites that she mentioned just a moment ago. So definitely be, be sure to check them out. But in the meantime, thanks once again for joining everyone.